Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go! Hey everybody, what's happening? I hope your day is going phenomenal wherever you are in the world. Uh, As you guys know, we on this show break down, deconstruct what top producers are doing, okay? Um, Now, today's episode's a little bit different. You know, I am trying to, I really am, guys, I'm trying to find agents that personify you. Now, it's great for you guys to listen to, you know, how X agent did 500 deals last year, but most of you guys are not in that in that spot. Uh, now, some of you guys are, you know, certainly we have, uh, you know, our one of our radio clients, Chris Cook, that does 700 deals, right? That guy's like, that guy's murdering it out there in Baltimore. But but most of you guys are not. So um, so I'm mixing it up. And if you and, and if you've been a listener of this show, you've seen us, you know, go from the 700 deals a year kind of guy down to 200, 150. Now today's guest, as you will hear later in this interview, uh, is a solo guy. Man, it's just him. So so we get into you know over the last 10 years, you know, some of his ha- aha moments. And, uh, you know, what he did wrong, what he did right. Um, Now, look, he's got an interesting background. He was a guy that just bounced around, man. He bounced around all sorts of odd jobs from teaching music to looking at, you know, being an air traffic controller to finally landing on his passion, which is real estate. Now, we talk about how his first six months, this guy didn't make a nickel from selling real estate. Didn't have one deal. And he shares that the only money he made selling real estate in his first six months was 20 cents he found in front of an open house. He was lo- he was lost, he was stuck, he was depressed, almost ready to quit, throw in the towel, but he didn't. So so we, we talked about his journey there. Um, w- again, we talked about what you guys should be doing right now for deals. A lot of you guys are in the situation that I need a deal right now. Now, you gotta be careful, as you guys know, right? Clients can smell that a mile away, um, but we talked about what you should be doing right now. Uh, we talk about why you should build your brand in your specific market and how he did it um, and why you need to personalize everything. So you need to be thinking about your brand first uh, as you as you build your business. Now, I, I want to run something by you guys. Now, um, I've never, you know, other than the, real, the radio arm uh, of this, and if you're thinking about radio, go to Real Estate Radio Experts. Here's what I want to talk to you guys about. I'm building a, a course for you guys. I've seen over and over and over again how even top producers are not using social media correctly. And it drives me crazy. I'm not going to say any names. Uh, where How people are going, yeah, I'm a social media expert. And then I bring them on this show. And I'm like, oh, you don't know anything. So I'm building a product for you guys. Now, um, I'll, I'll, let me tell you some of the modules, right? And it's basically, it's, it's going to cover intermediate or basic stuff like how to set up your first Facebook page and how to get your first 100 fans. Um, then we're going to get into, you know, using specific, uh, so it's going to go from basic to intermediate to full on, like, ex- full on expert stuff, right? So so it's going to be, again, how to build your Facebook page, get a, get your first 100 fans, so that's, we're going to get into ads, and like, and again, really the ads piece is going to be the, the, the really, really, you know, uh, high level or, or expert level stuff. But, you know, looking at your dashboard, how to use insights, how to use graph, you know, the Facebook graph to find your perfect audience, how to build, you know, a custom audience, how to build a lookalike audience, you know, all about ads. What kind of ads actually, what, your, what sh- should your ad look like, right? How many, how, you know, do you guys know um, and are you using like Facebook Messenger? Are you guys, you know, do you know, uh, well, look, whatever. So, let me know if you want to get on the early the early list here to buy this thing. Um, let me know. I think we're gonna, I think it's going to be 197 bucks for the first hundred people, 297 for the next hundred, and then it's going to cap out at 397. So let me know if you guys are interested. Send me an email. You know where to find me. All right, hey, let's get to the show. Today on the show, we're doing something a little bit different. Um, you know, you guys, we always bring on the top people. You know, with teams of 40 something people, 20 something people. Today, today's guest 
is all on his own. So he probably looks a lot like you guys out there. He doesn't have an assistant. He does everything himself. Uh, every year, every rolling 12 months, he'll do between 65 and 75 deals. Um, average sale uh, is mid-200s, and he's in St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm thrilled to welcome Adam Duckwall. Hey, Adam, thanks for taking the time out. Thanks for having me on the show. All right. We're going to get into... We're going to get into what's working, what's not working, how you manage that 65 to 75 transactions. But before we get there, Adam, take a minute, man. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm always curious about the person behind the machine here. Sure. Well, uh, I got into real estate about 10 years ago. Um, just kind of uh, wasn't really very intentional. It was just looking at options going, this isn't going to work. This isn't going to work. This isn't going to work. Well, I'll try real estate. See how that goes. Thought I would do it part time. That lasted about three months, and then I <laughs> realized I quickly had to make a decision what I was going to do. So I went head first into real estate and been looking down nose to the grindstone ever since. And so, what, what, what was your background? You said you know this wasn't going to work. This wasn't going to work. What 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 uh, what is your background a little bit? Well, I, I came from a teaching background, okay. and. Uh, um, I, you know, I was just, I was looking at various options of, you know, do I go into restaurants? Do I, you know, go, go work for, uh, you know, looking for a government job. Um, I think the last thing I looked at was air traffic control and Ugh. realized I'm too old for that. So real estate, you know, just checking stuff off the list and, um, dove into this thinking actually that I wouldn't like it. Hmm. Um, had, had no idea and then got into it realized that I had a, had a uh, love for sales and it was a really good fit for me. No. So when you say the teaching, were you a teacher or were, did, were you, were you an administrator? I, I was actually uh, a music teacher. Got it. Okay. Um, and so, you know, so you being a music teacher and I, I'm assuming this is high school. Yeah. Oh, uh, no, actually private studio. Oh, uh, okay. Yep. Performance. Yep. Okay, interesting, interesting. I mean, you know, teaching music to traffic control to real estate, that's, that's very, very, um, uh, that's an interesting background. So um, you thought you could do it part-time. You realized that you, you, you couldn't do it part-time. Maybe, maybe take us back to that first year. You, know, you, you, know, you didn't really have a sales background. Sure. You didn't have a, you know, a business background. Um, you know, how, did you, how did you start off? Well, I, I you know, went with one of the big companies in town. And, uh, you know, started off just doing probably what everybody else does. You go to your sales meetings, you talk to your manager, they tell you what you should do, what you shouldn't do. And you start doing various amounts of, of that and, uh, um, you know, grasping at straws, essentially. Uh, that's, you know, one of the issues that I have with the industry is that a lot of the, the training that goes on is, is ineffective. And that's why I think uh, what you guys are doing is great because you're talking to people who are actually successful in different ways in the business and getting good information out to people that's current. So, you know, as a, as a uh, new agent, I struggled, you know, I I remember sitting there in that, that resource room six months into the business, not a single sale to my name. I had business going, but not a closed transaction. The only money I'd made in the first six months was the 27 cents I found in front of an open house one day. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. But, you know, then, then, uh, come month seven and, you know, I had my first closing come month eight, I had three closings, you know, and I started, you know, you could see that things were happening and that those seeds that you're planting in month one and two and three, you know, are starting to come to fruition. These people are, are, are grasping, but you know, it, it's really a leap of faith. And, and I remember there was kind of a pivotal moment in the resource room again, an agent came in and, and asked me, you know, how, how are things going at him? And I was, you know, completely honest with them. I said, you know, I'm working my tail off. Nothing's happening. That's what it felt like anyway. Um, you know, working tons of hours and, and I don't know, you know, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. And at that moment I was, uh, you know, thinking, you know, give me another three weeks of this and I'm out. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, uh, then I realized, you know, after that person just quickly walked away and like, oh, okay. Um, you know, that it, it was my own reaction. It's that kind of reaction that, that kills it. You know, if, if, if I were to react that way in front of a client, 
if I was to be at that party, you know, yeah. that potential client, when somebody just says, when you're in real estate and people ask you, you know, they'll always ask you, how's it going? Because they, they want to know. Everybody's always interested in real estate. And if you give them a reaction like that, see you later, you know, they, they're testing you oftentimes, you know, mm-hmm. and, and so when these questions come in, you got to change your reaction. You got to, um, a- after that conversation and that, that epiphany, I realized I've got to, I've got to, you know, I, I can say the same thing. I can be truthful, but I got to be excited about it. You know, I, I can tell them, Hey, you know what? I'm working like crazy, which is true. I'm having fun. I'm super busy, but I'm always excited to do more. And when I started answering the question like that, uh, suddenly people go, well, that's, that's great. You know, actually we're thinking about buying a place, you know, or we're thinking about putting our place on the market. Could, could we have you come over? And so just, just changing my reaction to, to the questions that always come up, you know, how's it going? What, what's going on in real estate? Uh, completely changed the conversation, set the stage for, for uh, doing some, some real business in the future. Interesting. So, so reframing that, right? So, so, and I think that is important. I think, you know, reframing how you view what you're doing, uh, will, will, will mm-hmm. change your outlook, but, it, but also it, it helps shape, you know, the reality around you saying, Hey, listen, you know, I'm learning a ton. There's a lot to dig in, you know, a lot to, to learn about real estate and laws and, and, you know, and then it's really moving fast, whatever. So, um, so if we go back, right, you were sitting in, and this epiphany happened in a meeting. Now you, what you said earlier was you were sitting in these meetings. And people were telling you what you should do and what you shouldn't do. Um, mm-hmm. Give us an example of some of the things that that uh, um, that when people say you should do um, that that really didn't work for you, as well in the opposite way, what you shouldn't do, and maybe some of those things that did work. Sure. Well, I, you know, I guess shouldn't shouldn't isn't uh, necessarily the right thing, but. You know, as a new agent, I look at it as you, you need to be doing uh, the things that get you business right now. Um, those things are, you know, open houses, direct contact with clients. Um, you, you know, as, as an experienced agent, we can, we can, you know, um, try all kinds of crazy stuff. We can throw money at marketing campaigns where you're, where you're going, you know, I, this may work, it may not work. I'll try it. You know, we can do that, but those new agents, they need things that actually work. They need business right now. So certainly forging some relationships with, with, um, uh, you know, experienced agents and saying, Hey, look, you know, I'm, I'm new at this. I'm looking for business. You have, you you have, uh, um, buyers that you don't want to take out. You know, maybe the price point is too low. Maybe it's too far away from your home base. Give them to me. I'm I'm willing to drive. I'm willing to work with these people. You know, right. start start communicating with those people because, you know, the person who asks is is going to be the person who who gets the referral. Um, so so forge relationships with with experienced agents, agents uh, who are who are, you know listing agents who are um, you're getting all kinds of uh, leads coming in on their listings. You know they they have they have buyers that they aren't following up with. Um, you know, you, you want to tell them that, you know, you're willing to go do those things. Those, those listing agents, they have their sellers are requesting open houses, you know, depending on what market you're in, but around here, we do that a lot. Um, their, their sellers are requesting open houses and, and you can say, look, I'm willing to, I'm willing to do these. So, um, you know, you, you talk to those people, you get out there, open houses, uh, agents, uh, complain about them. They don't want to do them. And, and that always, uh, it's something I haven't really understood. And, and, and because an open house is an opportunity to meet unrepresented. And I mean that unrepresented, regardless of what people are telling you, most of the time they actually aren't under contract. So, uh, you, you're, you're in front of unrepresented buyers who are wanting to buy oftentimes in the next couple months. So that's a great place for, for an agent to be. Now, in terms of, you know, what shouldn't you do? Well, let's well, see, well and, let's and, Adam, somebody's hold on, hold ahead. on. Let's just, let's just unpack that a little bit because I, I I agree with you. I mean, I think that open houses. I think there's a resurgence across the country with with people doing open houses, and I, you know I just mm-hmm. want to iterate to to everybody listening. When you do an open house, 
uh, you know, many times you're, you may not find a buyer, but you, if you promote that open house properly, you know, by door knocking and mailing the, the, the closest two or 300 houses, you will find listings. You will find people going, hey, Adam's got hustle. You know, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Excellent point. Excellent point. And, and in fact, the first listing I got um, was a FISBO for sale by owner uh, who I had been directing marketing material to. Well, unbeknownst to me, there was another agent in my office who uh, lived in that neighborhood um, who had been directing uh, marketing at that same FISBO. Um, eventually, they called me and said they wanted to list with me, and I asked them why they chose me, and they said, well, you do a lot of work in the area. Okay, now, keep in mind, at this point, I hadn't sold house. Right. Okay. But the truth is, I had been doing a lot of work in the area. The work that they had seen was my nine signs for open houses around that area. So when they were driving home, they were seeing Adam Duckwall all over the place. Um, So if you're going to do open houses, here's a tip. Don't borrow your, your lead, you know, team lead signs. Don't, you know, use your blank company provided signs. You have to put your name on them. Yep. This is your billboard. This is your marketing. When, when, you know, if you can spend, you know, two to $400 on some signs, don't get four, get 10. Yep. You know, put, you know, choose your open houses based upon market, you know, or location where you can uh, be seen. You know, if you're, if you're doing an open house out in the middle of nowhere and there's going to be no traffic, you know, you, you're, maybe, maybe you pick up a buyer perhaps, but you're not getting that marketing splash. So, so make sure that you're, you're thinking about your open houses as a marketing opportunity. So yeah. That's what it is. Right, right. And many times, you know, many times the, with that same kind of notion, you know, if you can, uh, you know, there, there, it, when people see you and there's a prevalence about that, right, and there's a consistency about that, you know, even if you've not sold anything in that neighborhood, just, just as you were saying, you know, many times people go, God, Adam, you are everywhere. Like, you own this area. And you're like, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, that's right. I just have a couple of signs. Um, and I think, and I think, I th- you know, on that same point, I think that. Again, you know, this is a for sale by owner. Sometimes I think, you know, if if people are are going after those expireds w- w- and maybe those people are not realistic, there's value in having a sign in the ground. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> okay. Um, so yep. One other one other thing yep. I wanted to mention on you know on signage for open houses, um, I would do four open houses a weekend. Wow. Um, and and. Four open houses, it, it keep them short. There's no reason to, no reason to do, uh, you know, three hour opens. If you do a three hour open, you're going to get put on the back burner. Um, mm. Meaning that a client who wanted to come to your open will say, you know what, let's go to that one last because that one's open a long time. Let's get to these other shorter ones. Um, so they, they, they set up their schedule and then they don't make it to yours because they ran late at the other one. So, so you actually keep your open short and you do, you can do two, you could even do three in a day. I've done that before. You could do one hour open, so it would be fine. But the point is that you're getting all these signs out. So you do two opens with 10 signs out there each, and you're moving them around. And, and the, the, the real estate community, meaning the buyers as well as the agents, they're going, oh, my God, what, what is this guy doing over here? He's everywhere. And, and so I would have agents sending me referrals going, you know what? You work this area. I don't work over here, but I, you know, I drove through and I saw you all over the place. So pretty soon you're getting you're getting uh, compounding marketing, you know, from that even on the agent level. Yeah, you know, that's an interesting point. That's a very interesting point uh, that you bring out to to keep your open short. Um, we had a guy on the show, um, Denny Denny Griffin, um, and what he will do with an open house. And by the way, he got a TV show out of this, and I'll tell you, I'll share it with you briefly, Adam. Um, so what he will do, he, you know, he's, he, he gets a listing, uh, he promotes it heavily in, in the community that, Hey, this house is going to be open. It's going to be open for 60 minutes and we are going mm-hmm. to, and it's going to be, oh, this is the only time it's going to be open. We're going to take offers. You know, you can come walk the house, take offers, and we're going to sell it after this open house, right? And he'll, um, the next day, like an auction. I love it. It's kind of, it is like an auction. Yeah. But, but so, yeah. so he did this, he was so successful in his market that, uh, um, Bravo went and gave him a TV show. 
So, so again, uh, I think it's a great point to keep it short. You, you do have to promote it. So let me ask you this real quick. So, um, you know, you can, you can go to that, to that, uh, you know, uh, top agent in your, in your office. And I think, I think this is one value of, of potentially joining a bigger company in the, in the community. Um, because you can't, you know, there's, mm-hmm. there, you're going to have, you know, top producing agents in there and you can say, Hey, listen, do you have buyers that you don't want to mess with? Number one, number two, you know, do you, ha- can I hold some of your houses open? Mm-hmm. What, what is, you know, you alluded to the fact that, that when you think about an open house or, or choosing an open house traffic, right? Tr- uh, looking at traffic mm-hmm. and how much, uh, how many people you can get in there is one factor. Adam, what are some of the other factors that you consider when when you uh, are choosing a house to hold open? Sure, uh, great point. I mean, first of all, it should be in an area that you want to work in, and this is where you have to toe the line when you're going to talk to an agent. Um, and by the way, it doesn't necessarily have. I'm I'm with a big company, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't do this if you're at a small company. Hopefully if you're at a small company, you're working with some hitters. So you got one or two there anyway. Uh, But why not, why not go across the road to the other brokerage and talk to those agents anyway? Hmm. Um, Because, you know, uh, I don't know what, you know, across States, what you can do and what you can't, but in Minnesota, uh, you certainly, you can um, absolutely hold an open for another broker. Uh, you know, so I, uh, use it as an opportunity. You can always do that on a HUD property. That's by by statute. You you can absolutely do that. So you can always call a HUD listing agent. By the way, are foreclosures pro- uh, popular or not? You know, obviously they are. So you can always hold a HUD property open, regardless of what company you're from. Yeah, People don't realize that. <clears throat> They, they don't, and I think that's. I think. Uh, I think just even the, the the thought process of you know if I'm a Keller Williams uh, agent holding a Remax agent's house open, I think uh, um, I brought that up a lot, and I and, I, and I, there's um, there's there's weird philosophy around that, but I, but I I agree with mm-hmm. you. Now now look here here's here's what I tell people, and I and I want to get your take on it. If you're an agent, right? Here's what you said earlier. If you're a newer agent, man, you need to get business right now. You need to close something right now. Mm-hmm. I think the best way to do that is is to look at the, the, your MLS, right? And, and let's assume that you're okay with holding a, a, a Remax or a KW agents open. So look at the MLS. Find something that's been listed in the last three days, 72 hours, that you know mm-hmm. – is a great deal that you know is going to sell in the you know in the next yes. seven days, and that is the, yes. the house that you should target to hold open. Absolutely, there, it, it's going to be a hot open. You know, week one, week two. You know, um, you know that, that's you're losing all your traffic after that. So, um, you know, if you can hit it week one, I completely agree with what you just said. Okay. <clears throat> um, now it's also important, and this is just something I figured out over time. Um, that the the property that you're holding open, whether it should be or shouldn't be, becomes a representation of you in the mm. eyes of the, the client who walks in. So if it's a piece of crap, they see you as a piece of crap. Interesting. Okay. It might be a good deal, but it also has to it has to have, you know, some you know, positive qualities. If it's gonna smell like cat pee, you know, that's how they remember you. So um, you want something, you know, that's quality. It doesn't necessarily need to be expensive. You know, you don't have to be doing a seven, eight hundred thousand dollar open house. Uh, in my market, the best open house ranges are usually in the two to four hundred thousand. That's what I've experienced. Um, you, you get a lot of traffic, a lot of interested parties, and, and people are, you know, coming in excited and, and uh, you know, willing to share contact information. Um, there, uh, there's another thing that I figured out. Um, wait, 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 hold on, hold on, know, we, we, real quick, Adam. Right. So, so I think just real quick, you know, the the house that you hold open is a reflection of you. I would agree with that. The other thing I would say too is the house that you, the houses that you list 
is a reflection of you. So I think this is a Absolutely. I, I think but, but hold, this is the point that I'm going to make. I think that uh, you know with our we have this radio arm that I, I told you. One of the things that we do, we do a guaranteed guaranteed sold, right? We're going to sell it in 30 days or you pay mm-hmm. Adam nothing. Now the deal is one contingency of of that offer is that the homeowner goes through goes through a uh, an inspection process and repairs all the deficiencies. And I think if you can be the guy that that other agents know, listen, Adam holds or only lists crispy clean houses. <clears throat> I can feel comfortable bringing mm-hmm. my buyer there. I I, I think that's a uh, something for the audience to consider. Yeah, it's a great idea, great marketing strategy. But uh, yeah, for in, in terms of branding, if you can if you can create a quality brand, and that's a fantastic way to do it. I love that idea. So, what is the other thing you said I, when I cut you off? You said the, I, the, something else I figured out. Uh, let's see. We're talking about open houses. Um. It's going to come back to me, but I don't have it. <laughs> That's okay. All right. So, so, well, look, I mean. Uh, oh, yeah. No, I got it. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. So, um, if you have a incurable objection, hmm. and, and, and just to, you know, to define that, something that cannot be fixed within, you know, a, you know reasonable cost. For instance, a house on a busy street, Okay. It, how, how does it sell on busy streets all the time? We know this, but we also know that most buyers, the vast majority of them, won't buy that house. They will come and look at it because they're thinking, they're thinking, you know, well, maybe, you know, it looked great online if the house is good enough, but really the decision was already made. They just didn't realize it. You know, they, 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 for whatever reason, they've decided they don't want to buy on a busy street, but they're going to go to that whole open house anyway. That's a great open to be doing because you know, obviously, you know, if we're working for the broker, you know, if we are doing an open house for the same broker, you, you know, in, in our state, we are a representative of that broker and we need to do our best to, to, to attempt to sell that house. But once you realize that, that they're not interested in that house, game on. Okay. Now your focus is to pick them up as a buyer, right? So, um, you know, at that point, you can transition them into, you know, well, what else are you looking for? Well, I just saw, you know, five other properties or two other properties, you know, when I did a broker, uh, when I was doing broker tour earlier this week that I think would work well for you. If this one's not working, but you want a house like this, that's on a, on a quieter street, or, you know, this one almost works for you, but there's something about it that doesn't. Um, I saw one and they go, great. Well, when are you done here? I'm done in another 30 minutes. We'll close this up and I'll take you over there right now. You know, you're making that transition from, from uh, customer to client pretty quickly if you can do that. So having a, a house that actually doesn't work in some way, but it's still a great property, um, you will pick up more buyers in that property. Right. And, and I think to say what you just said a minute ago in a different way, I think what you're, you know, you're saying, listen, you know, n- know your inventory. Go ahead and hold that house open, but mm-hmm. you need to know your inventory. So when somebody comes at, at that $320,000 price range looking for a four bedroom, you can go, hey, listen, this doesn't work. I know three others r- right over here. Yep. Same price range. <clears throat> okay. You've got to know. You've got to know. And, and um, another small piece here. Okay. The, the, People are looking to you. They're trying to find an, an expert, yes, but they're, they're really, more than anything, they're trying to find a marshal for their transaction. They may not, you know, they don't think of it that way, but what, what they want ultimately is a person who will take them through that transaction, guide them through a process that they really don't know, that they do not understand what's going on. They know they're in over their head to some degree, but you show them that you are knowledgeable. Now you can demonstrate your knowledge in any way. When you're in that open house, you could be demonstrating your knowledge of, of, you know, home styles, vintages, um, you know, electrical issues. You could be, you could be demonstrating your knowledge of financing. Mm. They're going to latch on to something and they go, wait a second. If this person knows this much about financing, they must know everything about real estate, right? They will draw their own conclusions. So you need to have specific knowledge in something and be able to demonstrate that in that open. Maybe it's that you, you know, you saw them come in with kids and you go, you know what? There's a park three blocks down. It's awesome. I take my kids over there, you know, or there's, you know, this place is half a mile away. You can bike over to this trail and you can, you know, ride right on down to here. 
um, you know, that kind of information, all it, that's all it takes. And they go, wait, this is our guy. Yeah. This is who's going to help us find a house. Um, so you, you have to have knowledge. When you go out and do an open house for a, um, you know, some other realtor and it's out of area, you have no idea what's going on. You might be able to pick somebody up, but it's unlikely. And even if you did, would you really want to be working with the buyer? You know, that's, that's 45 minutes away. Yeah. So they see that one property and you're making that drive each time Ugh. at rush hour, <laughs> you know, yeah. try to work within your area if you can and know what's going on around the area and know, know something that you can share with, with clients and you'll, you'll have a much better time picking them up. Got it. No, I think a, a great, great point, right? You know, uh, to establish your, your expertise and in, in something, right? Whether it's, that's knowing the, the area, yeah, the market anything. or, you know, finance. Um, and look, mm-hmm. Adam, you keep talking about you keep talking about buyers and buyers and buyers. Now we know that you know you, everybody really should be trying to build their business on the listing side. Uh, out of that, let's call it seventy deals, right? You do sixty five to seventy five. I don't want to steal. It. Let's call mm-hmm. it seventy five. <clears throat> okay, mm-hmm. what is the percentage of listings versus uh, uh, one third listings, two thirds buyers? <clears throat> okay, two thirds buyers. Now, what we do know, mm-hmm. we we know that. You can handle seven listings for every one buyer. How in the world, man, are you doing two? Th- I don't know what I can't do that math that, that quite. <clears throat> two thirds of seventy-five, and you have no assistant. W- what have you figured out in terms of managing your time that you're able to do that? Um, what? Okay. Well, for me, it's the other way around. I, I can handle far more buyers than I can handle sellers. Really. And, uh, that's maybe just personal stress, uh, you know, how I deal with that. Yeah. Um, but I actually find the buy side much easier to control. And, and that's a uh, function of putting a team together. And when I say team, I'm not talking about, you know, my, my real estate team because we, you know, we decided that's not how I do business. Um, but my team is my title people, my mortgage person. There is no greater partner uh, for a realtor than their loan officer. And when I say their loan officer, I say that singular. You have one loan officer. Yeah. You never hand out three business cards. If, if somebody comes to you, um, they're, they're, again, looking for the marshal of their transaction, and they say, Adam, who should I work with for a lender? And I say, here's three business cards. What did I just tell him? I don't know. Yep. So supposedly I know my trade and I don't know who to work with. Now, if I say there's one person, you know, I've worked with hundreds of loan officers, but there's one person and only one person who I would recommend. And this is why bam, 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 bam. And you spit out some reasons. They're going to go, Oh, okay. And they're, they're going to, they're going to take that card and they're going to call that person and they're going to call them five seconds after they get in their car Um, because you can hard sell somebody else. You can cross on the cross sell. You can go as hard as you want to, but you can't hard sell yourself without sounding like a total jerk. So don't do that. But when you demonstrate your knowledge on the cross sale, it also reciprocates because you, you, you are again, a marshal. You are a knowledgeable person in your area who is pointing them in the right direction, which then, give the soft sell back to yourself. Hold on. Okay. You know, I, listen, I, I agree with that for a few different reasons that I'll point out in a second, but, but help me understand. I, I, I lost you for a second with, I didn't answer your, I didn't answer your question. I, I totally get that. I was going there, but um, to, to, to answer the question of how, how can you, how can you handle that many buyers versus sellers? If your systems are uh, clicking, if, if you have people going into one system if you're just out there working with, you know, 15 different loan officers and each one of their processes is completely different, uh, it's going to be a disaster. Got it. But if you have a hopper, if you're, if you are moving people into one, um, you know, well-controlled system and, and a great system, I mean, you can't, you can't confidently sell one person unless you truly believe they are the best. So you have to be working with who you think is the best. That's key. Um, but you, you have to get, number one, you've got to get your showing number down, right? Yeah. If you're doing 20 to 30 showings per buyer, it's not possible. But 
if you were doing five or less, maybe it is. Now, do you put those, do you put those kind of constraints on, uh, I mean, are you very upfront with, you know, let's say I come to you and go, Hey Adam, look, I know you're, uh, I see your signs everywhere in the neighborhood that I'm interested in. Um, do you just go, Hey, look, this, this is how, why I'm, I'm so good, man. I, I will, I'm so good at, at getting the fun. I'm only going to show you five houses. I mean, do you, do you, do you... No, absolutely not. I, I would sound like the biggest jerk ever. Okay. No, no, um, absolutely not. Um, no, the, the, the key is doing it organically. The key is get them into the best five houses, uh, for, that exist for them the first time. And, and doing that is an educational process. Okay, there, there are certain things that need to happen. I mean, first of all, they can't be working with substandard tools. They need to have, uh, they need to have the right listings in front of them. But what are the right listings? Is that what they told you when they walked in the door? Maybe, maybe not. But, you know, a, a client who comes in, you know, like if you told me what I wanted for, for my, my investment portfolio, I could spit out a few uh, really dumb sounding things, but you know, I, I don't really know. I would have to have a financial ex- advisor explain to me what I should be doing and what actually makes sense. Right. right, right. Well, we we're advisors to these people again, you know, the marshals of the transaction, but the first thing that we need to figure out is what is it that they're looking for? And you've got to figure that out. This is where, where, you, you know, it's important to be a salesperson and, and that's a term I embrace completely. And I see it often rejected in this business. But a salesperson is somebody who listens to the client, but what they're saying, and sometimes more importantly, what they're not saying. They come in, they say, I'm looking for a two bedroom condo, and, you know, and in this area. And then you start talking to them about, you know, who they are, um, who they might be with, what, what their life plans are, what they're thinking. You go, wait a second. You know, what I'm hearing is that really in 10 years, you want to be here. Well, if you buy what you're telling me you're, you want to buy, you're, you're going to be in a terrible position. You should be waiting another year and a half. You should be saving up this much money. You should be getting this kind of property. Let's do this right the first time. Mm. And they go, whoa, thank you. And so maybe you're not working with them for another year and a half, but in the meantime, they sent you four referrals because you actually gave them some useful information. Right. Well, that's, I mean, useful advice. I mean, that's, you you know, I mean, you're giving them, you're, you're guiding them. And I, and I think, you Mm -hmm. know, let's say not everybody, you can do this and not everybody you want to push them out another year. But I think the other thing too, is when they tell you, Hey, Adam, I'm looking for a two bedroom condo in this neighborhood. Uh, I think it's important to say, well, tell me why that's the case. And then, and then go exactly. uh, ask, you know, make them explain to you why, right? Validate the, what they're telling you, um, you know, go three levels deep to make sure that. Absolutely. So, all right. Absolutely. The, that, that's her job for sure. The, the, um, so, oh, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I'll let you finish that thought. I just want to, I'll make a well, point. Okay. So, so you got to figure out what it is, what it is they're looking for. Okay. Now, now enter the lender. This is why. I want somebody I trust on the lending side of things. Um, I, I happen to know a fair amount about lending just because I'm very interested in it. Uh, but, you know, once they get over and they meet with my lender, my lender is going to have a conversation with them about, you know, I mean, what, what it, they're going to always have a loan application, always have a loan application before they sit down with the lender. There's no point. I mean, a loan application is putting the patient on the table. The lender can't do their job if they don't have a loan app. So I always prep them for that. Before you call my guy, I want you to submit the, the loan application. And by the way, the, the link is in your inbox already to do it. Um, so they, they submit an online loan application, which takes 10 to 15 minutes, and they're done with that. They go meet with the lender, and the lender is going to then look at what they're doing from the financial side and go, okay, this is going to translate into you know, a qualification at this price point. Is this a comfortable payment for you? And they go, yes or no. And if it's no, well, okay, where is that level? And, and we're going to translate that into uh, a uh, price point to be searching for, right? So, you know, figuring out what is, is actually comfortable for them, and then we can translate that back into the home search, and they go, yeah, but at this price point, I'm not getting what I'm happy with. Um, well, you know, if, if there's a buffer between their comfort zone and their qualification, you can start, uh, you know, having those, that gap um, 
uh, taken down and see what, you know, where, where they're falling into a, uh, the right price range for the housing they want. And if they can't get that, then they shouldn't be buying right now. Yeah. So, I- you know, that just saved me months of showing properties to somebody who ultimately wouldn't have bought something. And I, 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 right, I agree. So I, the other thing too, the other thing is, is uh, for people out there, especially if you were a newer agent, the, another reason to use only one uh, loan guy uh, or title company or whatever is that, you know, these, these people, you, earlier you said they become your partners. I mean, they, these are people that will throw money towards your marketing for you because they, because you're fundamentally marketing for them. Mm-hmm. You, you got to be careful with respa on that one, but yes. Well, you, you're right. I, 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 right. I agree. I agree. But, um, but yeah. uh, uh, I mean, I have many, many people that you know, for radio, uh, you know, their their loan guy is throwing in half or more uh, for their radio budget. Um, okay. Uh, look, let's start wrapping up here. Um, I'm going to ask you kind of a crazy question. Um, is there something that, that I didn't ask you, Adam, that, that you feel like you should just get off your chest? Hmm. Well, um, I guess, yeah. Uh, what is, what is possible for a single agent? Mm. Okay. Right now I'm doing, I'm doing between, you know, like, you know, 65, 75, somewhere in that, you know, transactions right now. Um, that's easy. That's nothing. Um, if you really boil this process down. Uh, it is possible to do a great job. Remember, I mean, our job is to find the client, the right property, or if you're the seller's agent to find the right buyer. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but our job is to to find them that one house. Our job is not to show them 50 houses. You haven't taken something away from that buyer by showing them the other 49. If you showed them the right one, the first time, I think that should always be the goal. Get them into the right property the very first time. And that's done through education up front. So is it possible to sell 365 homes in a year as a buyer's agent? Absolutely. It is. Wow. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, writing, showing a property to and from plus the, you know, 45 minutes to an hour that you're there, you know, a couple hour investment, writing the contract, 30 minutes tops, you know, submitting and negotiating your offer, you know, you know, maybe, maybe you're, you're dealing with that for another 45 minutes in a day. Can you sell a house a day? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay. Well, okay. Um, um, that's interesting. Number one. Um, what about, what does marketing look like for you? Because, you know, we, we talk about marketing a lot on this show, obviously, Sure. but it's all around, mm-hmm. it's all around attracting, you know, finding listings. Uh, how does, what does your marketing look like if you're, okay. um, I, I, I'm certainly aware of the philosophy of, of, you know, listings and, and yes, I, I, I agree that listings, they bring in buyers. There's a lot of power in having listings, mm-hmm. um, but uh, I feel like we have more control from the buy side. Hmm. Now, you know, open houses, yes, you know, a great source of leads. Um, I think that purchasing leads is a great way to go. I do a lot with Zillow. Okay, I don't know if you guys talk much about Zillow. I love them. Okay? Uh, you are in the minority like crazy. Oh, sweet. Sweet, sweet. Okay. Um, no, I'm a big fan. Um, but internet leads are are um, not all created equal. Yeah. You know, pay-per-click leads, garbage. Hmm. Okay. But, but Zillow leads, I mean, that's in my opinion, as a buyer, sure. you know, somebody who does a lot with buyers. Um, and, and the reason is because smart people recognize pay-per-click ads and don't click on them. Other people will click on them. And, and you know, not that you always have to be working with the smartest people, but you're generally going to have an easier client to work with, somebody who's, uh, you know, knows what they're doing and is at the right stage when they happen to contact you. Here's the thing about Zillow. Okay. And it can, and it can go for, for Trulia or, or, you know, any other site where, um, you know, that's really focused aimed at the consumer, aimed at the buyer. Um, these people are trying to do this on their own. They're really trying to do this on their own, but they're getting to a point where they go, okay, I can't go any further. Maybe it's, I need property disclosures. I need somebody to help me write a contract. I need 
to get into a property, and I need an agent to show that to me. Okay, there's some stumbling block for them. So what do they do? You know, they're, they're, they're sitting there on Zillow. Here's three agents, four agents, whatever it is in your market. And they, they see these agents with their star ratings, with their reviews, and they're, they're going, hmm, let me read some reviews. And they look at them. Um, you know, they're going to see the past sales. They're going to see the reviews. They're allowed to be informed. Maybe they're not the best agents in the area, but they're the agents who are in front of them at that point, and they're picking between what they call premier agents. Um, and a listing agent. They have the option to contact a listing agent, at least in our market. So they can do that if they want to. Um, now, at this point, they have made a choice. They are picking what they believe is the best of the best. It was their choice. So if you are the agent on the receiving end of that phone call or email, if the phone rings and you answer it, you just validated their decision. They thought they were picking the best, and look at how responsive you are. You answered the phone the number one criticism of agents, right? They don't, they don't respond. They don't answer the phone. They don't call you back. So if you prove them right, you prove that you are the best agent in their mind, you've already made the sale. Got it. It couldn't be easier. Okay. They're great leads. Okay. That's good. That's a good tip, man. And I'm looking at your profile on Zillow. You have 31 reviews. Um, however, and on your website, stpauldiggs.com, you're only showing three testimonials, man. So uh, maybe that's... Oh, I know. I know. My, my, my website's a disaster. I don't use it. And it's because I've been, I've been very heavily focused in Zillow. Okay. You know, of course, it's on my back burner to, to develop out my website. But when Zillow works that well, um, you know, it's, uh, it, you know <laughs> it feeds you quite well. So I, I am, you know... They say don't put all your eggs in one basket. I'm more of a put put all your eggs in one basket kind of guy and watch that basket very carefully and that's not my line. Well but, <clears throat> Well here's uh, what here's what I, I'll tell you that I, I, I that you're doing a good job with. I mean um so I just Google Saint Paul, Minnesota, just M N real estate, uh Realtor dot com so I have an ad. Realtor dot com is first, Zillow is second, truly is third. Uh, Minnesota real estate team fourth, and guess what? Um, your fifth and your sixth. Uh, this might be you too. No, so your fifth and sixth. That's great. So you're 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 doing a great job with uh, 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 with Google Juice. Okay, man. Hey, look, we gotta start wrapping up. I'm gonna ask you the same three okay. questions that I ask everybody. The first one, Adam, who has been a mentor to you? my loan officer. Absolutely. Um, name is Charles Daly. Uh, he has his own company. Um, but that's, you know, something I didn't maybe talk quite enough about is your greatest partner in the business is your loan officer. Cause they are the person who is directly tied to your success more than your manager and more than a, you know, some team member, that person makes money when you make money. So, um, my loan officer has spent, probably, well, I would say thousands of hours training me um, and was instrumental in my growth as a realtor. Now, so, so okay, th- th- that's a good point. What, um, now, when you were a new guy, like, like how should somebody choose a loan officer? So you're a new guy, you have mm-hmm. big ideas, um, but you're not, you know, you're not putting numbers on the board. Should you go find an, an, another smaller, hungry loan officer, or should you try to, to, to go, you know, find the person that's doing the, mo- you know, the biggest name? Well, and- you got to find somebody who's doing using systems that you want to participate in, uh, and who, it, it's somebody who's who is very good because again, you need to wholeheartedly recommend them, and you can't do that if they're a newbie loan officer if they don't know what they're doing. So I would be going and working with the best now. Um, my loan officer has transactional relationships with, you know, many, many agents, but only really works with about four or five of us realtors. Um, but if, if you have a, if you have a handful of, uh, realtors that are sending 30, 40, 50 deals or more per year to that loan officer, they don't need to go out and work with a hundred realtors, you know, doing a couple deals a year. So they, they, uh, uh, the kind of loan officer that I would want to work with is somebody who is going to be personally invested in my business, not financially, obviously, uh, but, but, you know, somebody that, that, that really wants to see you succeed. 
it also needs to be somebody you can be friends with because you're going to spend an awful lot of time with that person. So try to think about, you know, personally, who can you deal with? Does it have to be a man? Does it have to be a woman? You know, I mean, think about what your, your needs are personally there because this person is going to be your friend or it's not going to work. Right. And so, and so just real quick. So on that, um, you know, how, um, mutually beneficial is your relationship in, 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 in terms of deal flow. You're, you're giving him 40, 50 deals a year, but you know, what about when he sources a, a buyer and approves them? Does he give you that deal as well? Well, I mean, certainly he can refer, you know, if, if, if there's a, uh, a buyer coming in that, that doesn't have a previous relationship, um, you know, he's not going to flip somebody, you know, over and oh, yeah, burn a bridge you know. with another realtor, obviously. Right. But if there's somebody coming in, you know, a past client of his that, you know, was unhappy with the previous realtor or something like that. I mean, who knows what the situation would be. The old realtor is out of the business. Um, and if, if it's in my area, if he thinks I'm the right guy for it, he'll send it to me. But if, if it's in a different area of town and Danny's the right guy or Mary Jo's the right person, you know, he'll send it, he'll send it that way. And it's really just, you know, to, to best serve the client. And that's where, you know, again, I think it's so critical that you're working with great people, you know, and great realtors or great loan officers so that you can genuinely, uh, you know, send that referral. You don't send them over going, oh, God, what, what are they going to run right, into right, over right. there? Yeah. You send it over knowing what their experience is going to be and that it's going to be a positive one. The only reason I bring that up is because I, I think that that you know most agents out there they they, they could be working with a, a loan a, a, a loan guy for years and never ask them hey what happens when you approve somebody um, that is not represented so I think everybody out there go go talk to your loan officer um, if you've not asked them that question um, all right so I always ask for a book recommendation Adam so here's the setup I I'm an aspiring agent I have twenty five bucks what book should I go buy today. Oh, 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 man. Well, as you look through you your know, bookcase, I, I could probably spout out the, uh, you know, the Keller Williams one. Yeah, I don't. Um, don't. <laughs> yeah, I hear it too much. Man. Um, what's a great book? Boy, you are asking somebody who doesn't read enough. Um, oh, oh, I'll give you one. Zillow talk. Interesting. <laughs> Did Zillow do that? Yep. Yeah, I think it just came out. Hold on a second. Book. The New Rules of Real Estate. I should get that. Um, okay, so, oh, it's an audio book. That's cool. Uh, Spencer Raskoff um, yep. uh, read it and wrote it. Well, look, everybody, if you haven't read this, which I imagine most of you have not, um, the book is called Zillow Talk, The New Rules of Real Estate. It's an audio book by Spencer Raskoff. So because it's audio, look, go get a copy on us. Get a free copy using our link, audibletrial.com uh, slash super. Oh, I'm sorry. Aud yeah, audibletrial.com slash super agents live. <clears throat> All right, buddy. Hey, man, um, here's the deal, Adam. I always ask my audience uh, if they've gotten anything out of this episode to, to reach out to you and say thank you. So where can people find you? Uh, they can find me at uh, stpaulbiggs.com. You can email me at adam at adamduckwall.com. Awesome. And everybody, listen, all the stuff will be on the show notes at Super Agents Live. Adam, I'll be the first to kick off the thank you train. Hey, man, thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Let's keep in touch. Take care. Bye-bye. Let's go.